So today, Jay Siegert is with us. He's an old friend, a fellow brother in Christ, uh, and he's going to share a message with us. What I love about Jay, besides his dry sense of humor and his rugged good looks, is his unapologetic confidence in the authority of Scripture. Jay is a nationally uh, recognized public speaker. He's written uh, three books. He's got a few more in the pipeline coming up. He's a longtime friend of KMCC. He has some great stuff to share with us. So Jay, why don't you come on up uh, and minister to us this morning? Well, good morning. It's always an honor to be here. I have a very, very powerful message that I think will be encouraging to everyone with the world being as upside down as it is. It's more important than ever that we understand God's Word and can defend it. So it's not, you know, when someone brings something up, it shouldn't be our opinion against theirs. We should say, hold on a second, let me see what God's Word has to say about that. We're just helping them understand this, and then it's up to them what they do with that. Uh, we're just kind of the middlemen here. So I'm going to be giving a message that's going to help you defend the Christian faith. And yes, you're going to be drinking from a fire hose. I have two speeds, off and fire hose. <laughs> off is not effective, so we're going with the fire hose this morning. Many of you know me very well already, but a lot of you don't know me very well. So I'm going to go through my background really, really quickly for those to whom I am new. Um, you don't know me from a hole in the ground, so here's me, and there's a hole in the ground. So... <laughs> Jason warned you. I, I just put that up there to warn you about my dry sense of humor that you have to be a little bit tolerant about this morning because that's just that's the way my brain works. But uh, I was raised in a Christian home, and you can see very clearly that this is a Christian home. <laughs> and I um, believe the Bible cover to cover. I uh, went to public schools all the way through high school. I graduated from Waukesha North because I was born in Waukesha and still live there. After I graduated, I went to a Christian college, John Brown University in Arkansas, to study mechanical engineering. I uh, got a degree there, but then uh, I became more interested in physics, and they didn't have a physics major, so I left there, came back to Wisconsin, went to UW-Whitewater to get a degree in physics, and that's when my world changed quite a bit, because I went from the small Christian college where my engineering professors opened up every class in prayer to the large state university where my physics professors did not open up in prayer. Uh, they were all evolutionists, some of them were atheists, and they were telling me everything I believed was wrong. And that made me feel very uncomfortable to be surrounded by these Ph.D. scientists who I assumed had a lot of evidence for what they believed. But I realized for the first time in my entire life that even though I knew what I believed, I did not know why. I couldn't defend the Christian worldview. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at um, this morning. And I also, about 15, 16 years ago, felt called into full-time ministry, founded the Starting Point Project. It's all about our starting point, which is what we're going to be talking about this morning our belief in God and in His Word. So I've been speaking for 37 years, but I've been doing it full-time, a little over 15 years. Um, and we hired our, our daughter, Tori. She's sitting in the back helping with slides and things uh, about five months ago or so, and that's really helped the ministry quite a bit. Along the way, I was also invited to be on the board of directors of a group called Logos Research Associates. It's the world's largest consortium of scientists who are Christians and creationists. Uh, the founding member, Dr. John Sanford, he's from Cornell University. He's famous for having invented something called the gene gun. It inserts genes into the DNA. This brilliant guy, very godly man, very humble, although he spent most of his life as an atheist. Then there's Dr. John Baumgartner. He's a Ph.D. geophysicist. He's built the world's best 3D computer simulation of plate tectonics. Just off the charts brilliant. Even secular geologists use that model so there's those two members, myself, and then there's three other board members. As brilliant as these guys are, and they're really smart, if they were here this morning, they would be the first to admit out of all six board members, I am the tallest. <laughs> so <laughs> I like to brag about that, but uh, it's just cool hanging around these guys because I get to learn some cutting-edge stuff and then put it into something we call English <laughs> so you can understand. So we'll be covering some of those things this morning specifically. But what we're going to be talking about here is Looking at the Christian faith from the most basic, fundamental angle possible. We're going to break it down as simple as possible. I'm not going to say, you know what, you just, you just need to feel it in your heart and just, just believe it, just have faith. It does require faith, but I want you to really think through this morning because you're going to need things like this when you're talking to skeptics and they got, they've got great questions. Well, how do you know God exists? How do you know the Bible is the inspired Word of God? So 
We're going to break this down as simple as possible to the two most basic fundamental tenets of Christianity. Number one, that God exists and he created everything. And then number two, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Those are the most two basic fundamental tenets of the Christian worldview. Everything else is a subset of one of those things. So we're going to spend half the time talking about creation and the other half talking about the inspiration of the Bible. The Bible certainly mentions these two things. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. So we'll be uh, hitting those two pretty hard. And i got to go quick. And the main thrust of this whole thing is that you can trust the Bible from cover to cover. Absolutely everything it says. And this is going to be really important for those who have just graduated. You're in high school now, or you're in college, or you're going off to some career, or whatever you're doing. You're going to need these things to defend your views and also be more confident when you're sharing the gospel message. So why does any of this matter? It's a very important question to address very quickly. It's because origin determines purpose. The origin of something determines its purpose. If I showed you this piece of equipment here, most of you would not know what its purpose was because you don't know what it is. But if you knew who the manufacturer was, they could tell you why they made it, what it is, and what it's used for. It's called a proximity probe. It detects vibration in large industrial equipment. I worked on these my first job out of college many years ago. But the point is, the purpose of that thing is all tied up in its origin. It's the same thing with everyone here this morning. Your origin determines your purpose. If you really believe this universe came about by some big bang, which the scientists who drafted the Big Bang tell us it was a purposeless event. It, it just happened. I know many religious people and even many Christians say, well, I believe in the Big Bang. Someone had to start it, so God used the Big Bang. That's a whole other talk. It's not a good scientific model. It doesn't fit in with Scripture, but again, that's a whole other presentation. And the scientists who drafted this say, hello, we, we don't need you. <laughs> this explains the origin of the universe apart from God. It really doesn't. But that's, that's what they believe. But if you believe the universe came about through some accidental thing, no purpose, and you're part of that universe, there's no purpose for your life either. You could make one up. Maybe you want to save the spotted owl. Great. What does that do for you when you're laying on your deathbed? Nothing. There's no purpose behind the Big Bang. Here's an interesting quote from William Provine. He was also from Cornell University. This is what he had to say. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells loud and clear. And I must say that these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposeful forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain I'm going to be completely dead. That's just all. That's going to be the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. Very depressing outlook but very consistent with an atheistic worldview. He was an atheist, so this is very consistent with what he believed and what many scientists also believe. Here's another atheist, Stephen Hawking. He was arguably the world's leading theoretical physicist, passed away just a few years ago. This is what he had to say. The human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among 100 billion galaxies. We are so insignificant that I can't believe the whole universe exists for our benefit. We are each free to believe what we want, and it is my view that the simplest explanation is there is no God. No one created the universe, and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization. There is probably no heaven, no afterlife either. We have this one life to appreciate the grand design of the universe, and for that I am extremely grateful. I could do a whole talk just on this quote. I'm just going to pull out two things really quickly here. First of all, he's extremely uh, grateful for the grand design. How do you have design without a designer? <laughs> you can't. He didn't believe in a designer. And also, he's extremely grateful for that. To whom or what? <laughs> he's grateful to particles for having banged together just the right way so his particles in his mind could appreciate how all the other particles moved. That's what he would have to think if there's no God. So again, it just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but I've I got to keep moving here. So the Big Bang equals no purpose. On the other hand, if you think the universe was designed and you're part of that universe, then there would be a purpose for your life too. And we'll be taking a look at some of that. Here's an analogy I came up with. Let's say you walked into a room and you saw this cake sitting there. 
you would instantly know somebody made the cake. You probably wouldn't even consciously think that, but you just know that. You could look at it closer, see how many layers there are, what kind of frosting they use. Those details would further confirm somebody made that cake. But you could look at those details all day long, and those details would never tell you who made the cake, why they made the cake, what they want you to do with the cake, and what they want you to do when you're done doing whatever they want you to do with the cake. You can't get that from looking at the frosting and the layers. But if the maker of the cake left you a note, then you could know. Hi, my name is Susie. I made the cake for you. Have a piece and then just walk away. I'll clean up later. You could know that if the creator of the cake left you a note. Well, it's the same thing with the universe we're in. There is so much evidence. This universe and life are not an accident. It's just amazing. But you could look at those details all day long, all life long, and they would never tell you who made the universe, why they made it, why you're here, or what happens to when you die. You can't get that from looking at dirt and DNA. But if the creator of the universe left you a note, then you could know. And that's what the Bible claims to be. The Bible claims to be a note from the creator. It says, hello, I'm the one who created all this. This is why I created it. This is what happened to it. Here's my plan to fix it, and here's what happens to you when you die. That's the claim the Bible is making. That doesn't prove it's the Word of God. Just because it makes those claims, I could make those claims in my book. But we'll take a look shortly as to how we know that this isn't just another religious book out there. We'll get to that in the second half of this talk. The first half, we're going to look at evidence for creation, and I'm going to perform a miracle. And in half of one talk, I'm going to look at the origin of the universe, origin of life, and origin of species. Jason's getting really nervous, but this will go fast. It'll go super fast. Again, drinking from a fire hose, looking at the first thing, the origin of the universe. What's the standard story? I already mentioned it, the Big Bang. We're all taught that, especially if we go into public schools. The Big Bang is not a good scientific model for the origin of the universe. It is covered with band-aids. It's on life support. Why is it still around? Because they don't have anything to replace it with yet. So you get the impression it's proven fact. All scientists believe it. They've got so much evidence for it. Nothing can be further from the truth. That would be a whole other talk to go into those details. i got to keep moving here. Back to Stephen Hawking, atheist, brilliant theoretical physicist. He had to address how do you get something out of nothing? In fact, how do you get everything out of nothing? Here was his answer. He said, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, most of you probably don't want to debate the world's leading theoretical physicist. Let's forget for a second how smart that guy was, and he was brilliant. But let's just think about what he said. I'm going to reword it slightly. Because there is something, the universe can well create itself from nothing. Wait a minute. If you have something, you don't have nothing. <laughs> and what was the something he mentioned? The law of gravity. Hey, what is the law of gravity? It's not a physical thing. Can't take it into a laboratory and weigh in, paint, and bend it. It's a description of how the universe operates. But you can't have a description of how the universe operates unless you have a universe to describe. But if you have a universe to describe, you're not creating it out of nothing. It already exists. So here's an example of a statement from a very brilliant scientist that makes no sense. Even other atheists called him out on that, says it's, this is not an answer, and it really isn't an answer. So let's think about this further, because we, we're really thinking this through. We're not saying just feel it in your heart. The idea of getting nothing that created everything, that's actually science today. This is what we teach in every public grade school, junior high, high school, and state university. Nothing created everything. When you push them far enough, they will admit that. First they'll say, well, the cosmic egg came from a fluctuation in the quantum vacuum. <laughs> Great, where did that come from? Keep pushing them. They say, okay, well, that, that came out of nothing. So nothing created everything, and they call that science. But if you say, well, I, I think something created everything, well, thank you for bringing that up. See, now that's a religious view, and you can't have that in the school system, separation of church and state. So that's just a religious thought that something created everything. Let's think a little further. Nothing created everything. Guess what? It's never been observed. But science is all about observation and seeing things. We've never seen nothing create anything, let alone an entire universe. And it goes against the known laws of science, particularly the first law of thermodynamics, which is one of the best laws we have that says you can't get something out of nothing. It's so consistent, we made a law out of it. And then thirdly, it's completely illogical. How can nothing do anything? 
Nothing is nothing but nothing. That's why we call it nothing. So we look at the other one. Something created everything. That's been observed. We've seen something create something else. You have all created things. It's completely consistent with the laws of science, and it's completely logical that something could actually do something. So in reality, the idea that nothing created everything, that's more like a religious, like blind faith view, whereas the idea that something created everything, that's consistent with everything we know about science. Moving fast, we can talk about the origin of life. Don't have time to talk about Stanley Miller, 1950s, put an experiment together to see if they could figure out how life formed on its own you know, about 3.8 billion years ago. That's part of another talk. We have time for one question. What are the chances that life formed accidentally, chemicals banging together over billions of years, and all of a sudden it turned into a living cell that could reproduce itself? The number I'm going to give you comes from Sir Frederick Hoyle. He was one of the world's leading astronomers and mathematicians. He was an atheist for most of his life. He calculated the chances of that happening is just one chance in... Now, i got a question for you. <laughs> What's your cutoff? What does that mean? If you find out the chances are less than one chance in some number, you're going to conclude, okay, that's not an accident. No way. What's your number? See, if you don't have a number in mind, nothing I share will make any sense. You, you have to have some criteria that you're going to use. So let's say for argument's sake, you say, okay, less than one chance in 10 million billion. That's a massive number. So if the chances are less than one chance in 10 million billion, you're going to conclude, okay, that's not an accident. It must have been designed. What was Sir Frederick Hoyle's number? He said one chance in 10 raised to the 40,000th power. That's a one with 40,000 zeros after it. Is his number bigger than the massive number you came up with? A little bit. It's your number, 10 million billion times 10 million billion. Times 10 million billion, times 10 million billion, two and a half thousand times you have to take your number, multiply by itself, and you finally get his number. But guess what? That's just a big number. It is so big you have no clue how big that is. So, simple analogy. Most of you have played with a Rubik's Cube. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> um, a Rubik's Cube has a lot of different combinations to it, and only one is correct. It has 10 million trillion combinations. So if you're blindfolded, someone hands you the cube and you're spinning it away randomly, you have one chance in 10 million trillion of getting it right. No sane person says, yeah, I could do that. We all realize, yeah, that's not going to happen. So let's compare solving that Rubik's Cube by accident to the big number Sir Frederick Hoyle gave us. It'd be like me handing you the cube, putting the blindfold on, you start spinning it away randomly, and you solve that cube 2,105 times in a row, getting it right every single time. Is that even possible, even close to possible? No. Why do we teach in every public grade school, junior high, high school, and state university, life formed 3.8 billion years ago, and dead chemicals came together to form a living cell? I love that story. There's just no science behind it. The more we look at science and chemistry and biology, it ain't going to happen. Here's a quote from an evolutionist. He said this, The belief that life on earth arose spontaneously from non-living matter is simply a matter of faith. Wait a minute. Scientists don't have faith. Scientists are in the laboratory proving things, right? No, they're admitting they have faith. Not only is it a faith, it is a blind faith and an unreasonable faith because they didn't see it happen and everything we're learning says it's not going to happen. But we keep teaching it because they don't want the other view to be true. So they only teach the students one view, and they want them to exercise faith, but they call it science. Third segment of creation. We're moving fast here. This one's really hard to do briefly, but I came up with this because I give hours and hours and hours of lectures on, on this, the variety of animals that we have on the planet. The big picture is this. Evolution predicts and requires Things to be going uphill over time, getting more and more complex over time. Billions of years, it just keeps getting better and better, more and more and more complex. That's what we would expect if evolution is true. Creation would be the opposite. God created everything perfect to begin with, Adam and Eve sin. Things have been going downhill ever since. Within the creation scenario, can we still have a variety of animals? Yeah, we can actually still have a variety very easily, but the trend genetically is going to be going downhill over time. Those are the two predictions. Let's see what we actually observe with science. 
Evolution teaches there was a single-celled organism 3.8 billion years ago that came from the dead chemicals, and then that single cell turned itself into every other life form on this planet over hundreds of millions, even a few billion years. Okay, nice story. I'm just going to be looking at one angle this morning, and that is the source of information. If you're going to take a single-celled organism, which is pretty complex, it's still a lot simpler than a human being and a lot less information in that single cell than in a human being. If that cell is going to turn into a human, where is it picking up the new information along the way? Scientists basically talk about two things, natural selection and mutations. You've all heard of those things. Let's see if these could provide the new information. Start out looking at natural selection. Natural selection is called survival of the fittest. And guess what? Natural selection truly does explain the survival of the fittest. It's a good explanation of why the fittest survive and other ones die out. But what it doesn't explain is the arrival of the fittest. How did we get creatures to begin with? Natural selection absolutely cannot create anything new. It's not even a force or anything. It's just a description that describes why some things die out over time. It's accurate. It was actually established by a creationist long before Darwin ever even mentioned it. So it's a good thing, but it doesn't create anything new. It's just a description. So that's not going to create new information. So the only thing we have left are mutations. And if I had time, I'd give you quotes from secular scientists saying mutations, only game in town, mutations provide the raw information for evolution to work. So let's take a look at this. And we're going to look at something called the waiting time problem. The, the board of scientists that I'm on, on the board of, Dr. John Sanford from Cornell, the gene gun guy and the plate tectonics guy, and two other scientists uh, built a software system called Mendel's Accountant where they could mimic living things. What happens when things reproduce? What kind of mutations are going on? What effects do they produce? They use that to then ask this question, how long would it take for mutations to give you the information you need to produce Darwinian evolution? This is really powerful. I'm going to try to keep it simple, but there are a bunch of numbers here, but I think you'll be able to track. So evolution says single-celled organism into every other life form. We're not going to look at that whole history. We're going to hone it down to just a portion of this tree here, just the one where something split off and went into chimpanzees and into humans. So human evolution, we're going to look at that portion. Can mutations provide information for that portion of the tree here? So they tell us it took six million years for some ape-like creature to go into chimp chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, and all that, and then another branch went off into all the ape men, hominoids, and then modern man. Six million years. Well, guess what? There are, conservatively speaking, at least 300 million differences in our DNA. It's probably more like 600 million or more, but let's just say 300 million differences between chimps and humans, and we've got six million years to produce that. These differences are the rungs on the ladder, and the DNA, we call it those nucleotides. So we have six million years to come up with 300 million differences. And these aren't just like ran make random changes. No, these are very specific, coordinated changes that can work together to build important things in your body. Not just waiting for any change, very good, positive, coordinated changes. So that's our target. We've got six million years to work with. We've got to come up with 300 million coordinated changes. So they ask the software, which mimics real living things, how long would it take to come up with two? We need 300 million. You've got to start somewhere. Two doesn't really do anything, but it's a start. They put it in their system. It would take 18 and a half, or sorry, 84 million years to come up with two. Then they ask, how long would it take to come up with eight? Eight doesn't really do anything. Eight changes on that ladder, eight nucleotide changes, is equivalent of like producing the English word Yes. <laughs> That's a very simple word. That's not going to build you a spleen, a brain, you know, nervous system and all that. You get the word yes. That would be eight changes. How long would it take to get eight changes? Eighteen and a half billion years. They tell us the universe is 13.8 billion years old. I don't really buy into a lot of that stuff, but this would take longer than the age of the universe, and you only come up with eight changes. So summarizing, Give them more than 3,000 times the amount of time they want. They need 6 million years. We'll give them 18 and a half billion years. They can only still produce 0.000027% of what they need. Mutations are not going to give you the information. This is so powerful. It's amazing. Um, every time we produce as humans, we add about another 100 mistakes or mutations to our DNA. 
and it can't be stopped. A lot of detail behind that. It caused one Russian scientist to ask this, how have we not died a hundred times over? If we've been evolving for six million years and every time we reproduce we're adding another hundred mistakes, we shouldn't be able to function anymore. We should have gone extinct. It's like opening up Microsoft Office software, the code. I, I did programming for 12 years. Open up the raw programming code and start making random changes. How long can you do that before it doesn't even boot up anymore? It doesn't take long. You certainly can't do that for six million years. We shouldn't even be here. But if God created us more recently, then that works very, very well. So mutations, again, are not going to provide that information. They have no source, none to provide that I don't actually have time to talk about the fossil record and how it supports the creation narrative and the flood, but very quickly, those of you who heard me speak uh, a week or two ago on a Monday night, on a Thursday night, I mentioned the Grand Canyon tours that we do. Um, so I, I lead uh, guided tours of the Grand Canyon, all showing evidence for the Genesis flood. It actually happened, and it is, other than the creation account, is the most major thing that's ever, ever happened on this planet, and it changes everything. And so we actually spend one day rafting the river on the horseshoe bend here. That's where we would be about 1,100 feet down, going around smooth sailing around the bend here. We also spend one day walking along the rib, Kaibab limestone, looking one mile down to the Colorado River. And we give these mini lectures showing how this canyon must have been, the layers were laid down catastrophically because of the fossils and many other things, and it was carved out catastrophically. It's physically impossible for that Colorado River to have carved that out over millions of years. I've got to skip the details. It's got to keep moving. But if you're interested, uh, we do these tours. You also will stop and see some dinosaur footprints. You can walk right on them. They're all over the place on this Indian reservation. We also get a really cool photo op. We, everyone gets off the bus and we get under the rock. If anyone tips it over, they're responsible for putting it back up. Um, but it's a really cool thing. You know, the whole, whole gang is there under the rock. Some people stay later, which... I've done once, and then Tori and I are staying later. Two weeks from tomorrow, we'll be going back uh, with another group to do a tour, and we're going to fit in Antelope Canyon. It's beautiful there. That, I took that picture with my phone, and we have a beautiful brochure that was created by Tori. <laughs> so, <laughs> she didn't know her picture was going to be up there. But, so we have brochures out on our table there if you're interested in the details. But again, it's all about evidence for the authority of God's Word. Got to keep moving. That was the origin of the universe. We, we just flew through that. We got to look at the second half here. I think it goes even faster, looking at how do we know the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Most skeptics have an opinion of the Bible based on what somebody else told them. It's not their own thorough research. Someone else told them it's filled with errors and contradictions. There's missing portions and extra stuff that got shoved in here. Science has disproved it on and on and on. All those things, they don't really know any of those things. Somebody told them, and that excited them, and they use that when they're arguing with Christians, and most Christians can't respond to those things. So we need to address these things very quickly here. I've also had people tell me there is no evidence that God wrote the Bible. I have a response for them that you can also have if someone ever says this to you, and you want to say it very graciously, but they say that, you ask them a question. What would you accept as evidence that God wrote the Bible? You say there's no evidence. What would you accept as evidence? If you saw A, B, or C, that would definitely be evidence I've had them say to me, literally, I don't know, but I know there's no evidence. Wait a minute, if by your own admission, you don't even know what the evidence would look like, how do you know it doesn't exist? In fact, if you don't have criteria that you use to judge what counts as evidence and what doesn't, you can't even have this conversation. So they will make that bold claim, but they don't even know what they're expecting. They don't know what they're looking for. Well, I think this, if God actually wrote a book, what would we expect to see? First of all, I would expect to see it to be internally consistent. It wouldn't contradict itself. If it contradicts itself, it's good evidence God didn't write that. I'm going to list four things here. These are not special Bible tests. These are tests you could apply to any religious writing out there to see if it shows evidence of having been inspired by God. Secondly, historical accuracy. If the book you're looking at, whatever it is, if it gets history wrong, that's pretty good evidence God didn't write that. He would know history. Thirdly, prophetic accuracy. If the book you're looking at makes predictions, if they've been proven false, Pretty good evidence God didn't write that because he would know the future. Last one, scientific accuracy. If the book you're looking at makes statements that can actually be tested by science and they've been proven false, that's pretty good evidence God didn't write that because God would know science. Four tests. I'm going to make brief comments on three of the four areas, starting out with internal consistency. This is, might be a little confusing as to what that means, 
but the analogy will make it very, very clear. Let's say we have two guys here, and here's their background. They're both born and raised in Dallas, Texas, at the same age, born in 1950. They both have PhDs in U.S. history. They're professors of U.S. history at the same university, and English is their native language. These guys are basically identical in their backgrounds. You ask these guys to write a 300-page research paper on one controversial event, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, an event that happened in their city, in their lifetime. Would these two guys, identical backgrounds, agree in every detail they wrote about that controversial event? Not hardly. But that's just one event written about by two guys that happened in their city while they were alive, and they're experts in history, and they won't even agree with each other. You contrast that with the Bible. It's got about 40 different authors, written over a period of about 1,600 years on three different continents, written in three different languages, in different settings, at different times, and it doesn't cover just one controversial topic. It covers hundreds of controversial topics, and yet all the writers are in perfect agreement with each other. How is that even possible? Unless God is actually inspiring every one of those writers in everything that they wrote. Next one, really quickly. Prophetic accuracy. This is probably the most powerful evidence for uh, inspiration of the Bible. Some of you remember Yogi Berra, famous baseball player and coach. He was always saying crazy, funny things. This is one of my favorites. He said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> and, and that's true. It's tough to make predictions. Most people don't. Because you're wrong about most of what you think. Yeah, you'll get a few things right, but most you're going to be just flat out wrong. Well, look at what the Bible has in its prophetic content. Over 8,000 passages making over 1,800 predictions covering 700 topics. That means a full 27% of our Bibles are prophetic in nature. Some of those prophecies are for our future. Every single other prophecy has come true in every minute detail. And some of the prophecies were just bizarre. They weren't saying, well, in the next few years it might get a little warmer. Well, you've got a 50-50 chance there. You know, that's probably going to happen. The prophecies are much different. And I've, I've got some examples here. The, the city of Tyre. I think this is the only one I have in this presentation. If you find Israel on a map, go just north of there in Lebanon, there's a city of Tyre right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. The city of Tyre was the most prosperous and ancient you know, city in, in history. It's amazing. What did the Bible say about the city of Tyre in Ezekiel chapter 26? For the time we have, just focus on the highlighted words. It said that specifically from the north, King Nebuchadnezzar would come and attack the city of Tyre. That's very specific. Well, guess what happened in history? King Nebuchadnezzar came from the north and attacked the city. It got that one right. It said many nations would actually come up against the city of Tyre. Guess what happened in history? Many nations came up against them, including these nations here. So the Bible was right again on that one. And then it said, it would scrape her dust from her, make her like the top of a rock. It says, I will lay thy timber, oops, back up, I'll lay thy timber and thy stones and, um, and the soil in the midst of the water. So it's going to destroy the cities, and then it's going to take all the rubble and everything and cast it into the sea. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, go kill the people, knock your buildings down, burn some stuff and be done. Why spend all the time and effort to take all that and then throw it into the sea? doesn't make any sense, but that's what Ezekiel prophesied. Well, guess what happened in history? It was scraped bare and the debris was cast into the sea. Why? Because Alexander the Great came and he wanted to attack the people. But many had escaped to a nearby island and he couldn't build big enough ships to float an army to get over there to attack them. So he took all the debris from the city, threw it into the sea, and built a bridge so we could march across there and destroy the people. And today, if you look at a picture of Google Earth, it's actually filled in here now. That was the island. It's been filled in here to the mainland because of what Alexander the Great did. The Bible's right about that prophecy. It also said it'll be a place for spreading of nets. It'll never re be rebuilt. It'll never be found or reestablished again. And it hasn't been. It's in a perfect place to be rebuilt, but fishermen actually lay their nets there. And the Bible is right about those specific weird details. And we get this from the Encyclopedia of Columbia. It says, The principal ruins of the city today are those of buildings erected by the Crusaders. There are some Greco-Roman remains, but any left by the Phoenicians, the people lived in Tyre, they lie underneath the present town. The Bible passes that test, this, the prophecy of the city of Tyre. In fact, 
it passes all four of these tests. Um, but we're going to look at one more. Really cool. This is one of my favorites because of my science background. We're going to look at the scientific accuracy of the Bible. And again, the skeptic says, no real scientist believes the Bible. Well, anyone who says that, they're a bit uninformed. In fact, the truth is most major areas we have of science today were founded by Bible-believing Christians. If you'd like a few examples, I brought a few along. Antiseptic surgery, bacteriology, calculus, chemistry, computer science, electronics, electrodynamics, electromagnetics, fluid mechanics, galactic astronomy, gas dynamics, genetics, <laughs> Hydraulics, hydrostatics, oceanography, optical mineralogy, paleontology, pathology, physical astronomy, stratigraphy, thermodynamics, thermokinetics, vertebra paleontology, and a scientific method, all founded by Bible-believing Christians. Anybody who says no real scientist believes the Bible, they don't only not understand science, they don't even know history. This is where science came from. It was birthed out of the Christian community. Here's one of my favorite examples from a longer talk. This is Exodus 15.26, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, I will put none of these diseases upon thee. What's going on here? Big picture. God creates everything and is perfect. He creates Adam and Eve and they're perfect. They sin. They disobey God. They get kicked out of the garden. That brings death and a curse into God's perfect creation. God could have just smashed them and started over, but he said, no, I love you too much. I got a plan. He's going to send his son to die on a cross to pay for the sins of the world. The entire Old Testament is God playing out that plan, which included God choosing a group of people through which his son, the Messiah, would be born. Those are the Hebrews who become the Israelites and the Jews. The entire Old Testament is also Satan, who hates God, trying to ruin that plan. So the entire Old Testament is Satan trying to wipe out the Jews because if he can, the Messiah can't come. And it's God trying to protect his people. In this passage, Moses is saying, listen to the health practices that God is telling us and we won't get the diseases that are affecting the nations around us. But we know from the book of Acts that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now, he went to Egypt, you. Today, if someone goes to a state university, get a PhD, and then they write some books, you would expect that a lot of the information in those books would have come from what they learned at the university. It's just kind of how it works. Well, Moses goes to Egypt, you, and then he writes five books. Yeah, the first five books of the Bible. So do we see Egyptian wisdom in the Bible? We should if Moses made it up on his own, and that's what skeptics say. He was an ignorant goat herder, just scribbled some stuff down, made a new religion, now we got another religious book. That's what they believe. Well, let's take a look at some Egyptian wisdom through which he was educated. This is the Ebers Papyrus, written about 1550 B.C., contains over 800 magical remedies and formulas for things, one of which is if you've got a splinter, you're supposed to apply worm blood and donkey dung. <laughs> Modern scientists say, yikes, you, you don't want to do that. It causes tetanus spores, you can get lockjaw, you can get really sick, you could even die. That's the kind of stuff Moses was educated in. So do we see things like that in the Bible? We should have. Moses made it up on his own, and that's what skeptics say. Let's take a look at what he actually wrote. Moses talked about touching a dead body. Now today we know about bacteria and germ theory, especially with all the COVID stuff. Um, you don't want to touch a dead animal. You could get germs from that. You could get sick. You maybe could even die. What did Moses tell us? In the book of Numbers, chapter 19, Moses wrote this. Whoever touches the dead body of anyone will be unclean for seven days. He must wash himself in the water of purification on the third day and on the seventh day, and then he'll be clean. Okay, what's this water purification he mentioned? A few verses earlier, he tells us. He says the priest is to take some cedar wood, hyssop, scarlet, and wool, and throw them on the burning heifer or cow. That sounds bizarre. Any of you are old enough to remember the Beverly Hillbillies? It sounds like something Granny would come up with. So I put possum in there and stirring around. She's just doing weird things. That's what this sounds like. It sounds like just some weird thing. But modern scientists say, no, that, that's not weird at all. It's really interesting. And here's why. The cedar wood and burning heifer ashes combine to make lye. That's a caustic soda. We call it soap. <laughs> you touch a dead body, washing with soap would be a good thing. The hyssop plant converts into thiamol, which is isopropyl alcohol. It kills bacteria. You touch a dead body, killing bacteria would come in handy. The scarlet wool forms a gritty substance, like an SOS pad in your kitchen or orange goop 
You might use that to get grease out of your hands. Orange goop has pumice in it. It's very abrasive. That's what uh, the scarlet wool does. And then applying it on the third and the seventh day, bacteria grow very well in a damp environment. So you want to wait a few days for this to dry out, and then you apply it. Wait a few more days, you apply it a second time, and you're considered clean. Modern scientists tell us this is a great natural remedy if you don't have antibiotics that we create today. Did Moses know anything about germ theory and bacteria and isopropyl alcohol? Obviously not. This is God saying, hey, Mo, <laughs> I want you to write some things down. <laughs> some of you got that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so he writes it down. And Moses said, that was awesome. You got anything else? And God says, let me think. Yeah, I got one more. So I'm just going to give you one more before we close here. Moses, Moses wrote about a certain Jewish tradition in Genesis chapter 17. He said, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Why did Moses say the eighth day? He could have said anything. The third week, the fifth year, he could have said anything, but he said the eighth day. Modern scientists have discovered some pretty important things about something called blood clotting. There are two major elements in your bloodstream that are necessary for blood clotting. You miss one, you could bleed to death from a paper cut. Vitamin K and prothrombin. On a molecular level, there are about two dozen events that have to fire off in proper sequence to clot your blood. You miss one, you're dead. How did that evolve over millions of years? Some creature has event A. Great, doesn't do anything. Then it evolves A and B. Doesn't do anything. A, B, and C. A, B, D, C, F, G doesn't do anything. A, B, D, C, F, G, H, I, R, R, W. No, it's got to be about two dozen all in a row, all at the same time, ready to go, or you can't reproduce. That's another story. Back to the larger picture. We've got vitamin K and prothrombin. Scientists have discovered vitamin K develops in a newborn somewhere between days five and seven. That's when it kicks in. Prothrombin looks like this if we graph it. The line across the top is a normal level of prothrombin in your body. The numbers across the bottom are days after birth. Scientists have discovered on day one, a baby has about 90% of its prothrombin. That's pretty high. That's not bad at all. But then it drops dangerously low between days two and five, down to only 30%. That's not good at all. But then on day eight, it spikes to 110% of its normal level. It will never be that high again the rest of your entire life, only on day eight. So if you are a baby and you need a surgical procedure, day eight is the perfect day because for sure you have vitamin K and you have more prothrombin than you'll ever have the rest of your life. Did Moses know anything about vitamin K and prothrombin? Obviously not. This is God saying, Mo, write it down, and he writes it down. Quick side note, you know, Amy and I have two children, Tori a year and our son Taylor a year and a half older. When we were going to have Taylor, or our first child, we went to the hospital to go through the birthing classes. It was a new process for us. So the nurse was you know, getting everyone up to speed, and she said, if you have a baby boy and would like the procedure done, we'll take him down the hall and bring him back. I remember, as if it was yesterday, sitting there being nervous. We shouldn't do that right away. We should wait till day eight, but I was too shy to say anything. So the nurse keeps talking, and someone else raises their hand and said, hey, nurse, you just said you're giving the baby a shot. Why does the baby need a shot right away? So said, well, that's vitamin K. So today, they artificially introduced vitamin K, so you got that. That's not a problem. And you have 90% of your prothrombin on day one. It's not an issue. It's certainly not a moral issue. My, I didn't even want it to, but my hand went up in the air. <laughs> And the nurse called on me, and I shared with the, the class there what Moses had to say about all this in Genesis. <laughs> I don't know if they were impressed or not, but I get a chance to talk about the inspiration of Scripture. So the Bible not only passes this test of scientific accuracy, it passes all four tests of internal consistency and historical accuracy and prophetic accuracy and scientific accuracy. So wrapping up, do Christians have faith that the Bible is the inspired Word of God? Yeah, we do. But it is an incredibly reasonable faith backed up by so much evidence. And we're just scratching the surface here. In fact, if you want to believe that the Bible is not the inspired Word of God and the immortal words of Ricky Ricardo, some of you know, you've got a lot of splaining to do. <laughs> if a bunch of people made that up, how did you get all these 40 different authors on three different continents over 1,600 years, all different educational backgrounds, writing about hundreds of controversial topics, they all agree. How they get all the history right? How they get all the prophecy right over and over and over and over and over, every minute detail? How they get all the science right when they didn't have microscopes and telescopes? If you want to believe it's not, your faith is much stronger than mine. To me, the Christian faith is a very, very, very reasonable faith. And the takeaway, like I mentioned in the beginning, 
is you can trust the Bible in absolutely everything it says. And there's so much more we could cover. The more we learn about science, we're like, well, I guess the Bible was right all along. Who knew? Maybe God knows what he's talking about, and we can trust him for everything he says. Really quickly, my least favorite part of my talks, resources. We've got a bunch of stuff out there. Everything we have out there is also available online. We have about 22 video sessions on 11 individual DVDs. They're all streamable as well. If you get the physical DVD, you get the streaming for free. Uh, and if you get the streaming, any new ones we come out with, which I'm going to do 22 more, those are just getting added for free as well. Three different books. The book on creation and evolution, I've been told by some of the world's leading scientists, I think it's the best overview that's out there. I was honored to hear that. The other two books came out within the last few months. And we also have uh, one of everything special. If you get that, then you get all 22 video sessions and the streaming and, and the three books as well. I have a monthly newsletter. It comes out the first of every month. It's free. It's an email newsletter. If you sign up, you'll get that just once a month. You can sign up on our table or you can go right to our website and sign up. I've done a lot of live stream broadcasts. They're all posted on our website, all the past ones, covering a lot of different topics. Uh, so you can watch those to glean a lot of information. So you just go to our website and find live stream archive. You'll be able to watch all those for free. I write a question of the month article, which we put in the newsletter, but it's also posted on our website to get you to think a little deeper, like should you take the Bible literally? I always tell, tell people, I don't, I don't take the Bible literally. And that shocks, everyone here is shocked, unless you heard my talk a few days ago. Um, no, I don't take it literally. Take it contextually. The portions in here that are written as literal historical narrative, I take very literally. The portions in here that are written as poetry, I take poetically. But I also take it very truthfully and very seriously. I believe the whole thing cover to cover, but sometimes God teaches us truth through poetry. So when it says he covers us with his wings, he's not trying to tell us he has feathers. He's trying to teach us he covers us with his wings. He's protecting us. So I believe he protects us, but he's saying it poetically. So you take the Bible contextually. Portions of poetry, you take po poetically. Portions are historical, you take literally, like you would take any other book. So I do um, questions of the month that get you to think a little bit deeper. Those are all available on our website. It's two of the old ones. And then the main thing I do is travel around and speak. We don't charge anything. Uh, we just ask for travel expenses to be covered. But if you're interested in having me speak, maybe you used to live somewhere else, you have a connection, you could fill out our form and turn it in um, and see if we can get connected with another church. And then I already mentioned Grand Canyon tours. Grab a brochure if you're interested. Um, and you can always get a hold of us through our website, thestartingpointproject.com. It's all about defending the Christian worldview, and I always say, I teach you all this so you can memorize every detail and go out and win arguments with people and make them look foolish. And I shake my head, no. no, That's not why I'm here. I don't expect you to remember these details. I expect you to walk out thinking, oh my word, I, I don't know that I'll remember any of that, but boy, do I know I can trust God's word. And then you run out not to talk to people about DNA or anything. You run out to share the gospel message very graciously, very kindly, knowing if they bring up tough questions about carbon-14 dating or the violence in the Bible, you might not remember the answer, but you know answers exist. And you say, I can get back to you. And then you get back to them again very graciously. But it's about sharing the gospel message first and foremost. But you want to hear these other things so you can be more confident in God's word so you're not hesitant to share the gospel. So, I will close in a word of prayer. I look forward to seeing you in the lobby afterwards. Dear Holy Father, we just thank you so much for this time we've had to take a look at the authority of your word. I thank you for each person here this morning. I pray that even this coming week, God, for every person, you would bring someone into their path this week who needs to hear the gospel. You would prompt them and allow the Holy Spirit to do all the heavy lifting. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.